Thank you. Uh, before we start, I just want to have a quick moment of silence for uh, Lieutenant Fire, Fire Lieutenant uh, Michael Davidson, whose funeral is happening right now. Okay, thank you. Um, and I have to note that Councilwoman Barron will not be joining us today because she is at a funeral. Um, okay, do I have to gavel in? Oh my God. <laughs> Good morning, procurement fans, uh, and welcome to the uh, Committee on Contracts Fiscal 2019 Preliminary Budget Hearing. I'm Justin Brandon, Chair of the Committee. This morning we'll be reviewing the proposed Fiscal 2019 Budget for the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, or MOCS. I'd like to welcome Director Daniel Simon of MOX to thank him for testifying before the committee today. Today we'll be assessing MOX's programs and activities, including their continued uh, work in optimizing the procurement process, reporting on the city's procurement performance through the agency procurement indicators report and various other responsibilities that ensure the integrity of procurement throughout our city. The mayor's fiscal 2019 preliminary budget for MOX is $17.6 million. Uh, that includes $15.4 million in personal services, uh, personal service funding to support 190 budgeted full-time positions. This funding is primarily allocated towards uh, reporting on and evaluating the city's procurement activity, as well as taking measures to facilitate and optimize the procurement process within. Uh, within New York City. In a few minutes, we'll hear more from Mox on their specific goals for FY19. In our discussion with Mox this morning, I hope to explore uh, the different areas of the city's contract budget in order to gain greater clarity and understanding regarding where and how money is being spent to add capacity to the city's procurement processes and evaluation. I look forward to hearing more from Mox regarding its achievements in procurement reform in particular, the impact of Passport over the past year and what we can expect to achieve with Passport uh, going forward. Additionally, I'd like to hear the office speak to any citywide procurement trends related to cost overruns. Um, MWBE utilization and citywide savings are of particular interest. Uh, lastly, I'd like to begin a discussion today uh, to identify any challenges the agency is facing in filling staff vacancies as well as what more we can expect from MOX once the agency reaches full or near full uh, staff capacity. After we hear from the office members, we'll have a chance to follow up with questions for the director if they uh, come. Following that, members of the public will have an opportunity to provide testimony, which I look forward to. I hope that director or members of your staff, uh, Director Simon, will stay to hear the public testimonies. I always think it's a shame when the public testifies and they testify to an empty room. Um, before, we begin, before we begin, I have to acknowledge my colleagues. Uh, and Before I turn the floor over to the administration, I have to thank my committee staff, uh, policy analyst Casey Edison, um, legislative counsel Alex Polonoff, financial analyst Andrew Wilbur, uh, finance unit head John Russell, as well as my senior advisor Jonathan Yedin for all their hard work uh, in putting this together today. So I'll give it to Alex now to swear you guys in. Would you please raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you. Good morning, Chair Brandon and members of the Contracts Committee. Thank you for inviting me back to share more information about the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. My name is Dan Simon, and I'm the Acting Director and City Chief Procurement Officer. Today, I will further describe our work and explain how we are resourced to advance efforts to oversee, facilitate, and transform procurement for the City of New York. As I shared last month, the City's procurement process remains complex with ample room for improvement. Various steps from vendor management through to solicitation and invoicing present opportunities for business process reengineering and utilization of proven technology solutions. 
As we implement long-term fixes, our day-to-day -day oversight role has evolved from mere compliance review to providing intricate advisory, hands-on, and technical support to agencies. The fiscal year 2019 preliminary budget provides MOC $17.6 million, including $15.4 million for personal services to support 190 full-time positions and $2.2 million in other than personal services funding. Across the five-year plan window, our agency's budget funds and, head, funds and headcount remain relatively flat. As of today, we have 145 active employees across two sites. Since the fiscal year 2018 adopted budget, MOX's budget has increased by approximately $836,000. This increase in funding enhances our capacity for nonprofit partnerships and improves our data and reporting capability. With the advent of new technology solutions and the subsetting of legacy systems, we will now be able to consolidate existing data from legacy city systems, manage data more efficiently, and benefit from enhanced analytics tools. Overall, our budget reflects efforts to realize efficiencies in both the near and long term, and these resources support five key areas of work. Technology solutions, learning management and support, compliance and partnerships, data and reporting, and internal operations. Our primary technology solutions are HHS Accelerator and the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal, or Passport. HHS Accelerator streamlines, standardizes, and digitizes the management of procurement and financial transactions for human service delivery, thereby reducing administrative burden and saving time and resources pro for providers and city agencies. In response to feedback from providers and city agencies, MOX enhanced HHS Accelerator financials this fiscal year to simplify budget modifications, reduce duplicative audit communications, and enable onboarding of contracts from the Department for the Aging and the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. We implemented Passport using lessons learned from HHS Accelerator and response to considerable advocacy from our vendor community. As we have shared in previous testimony, the vendor disclosures process, formerly known as Vendex, is now online, benefiting all vendors who seek to do business with the city. Online updates and electronic certification of filings enable thousands of vendors to focus, focus more on mission critical activity. To date, nearly 9,000 vendors have created passport accounts with nearly 6,000 successfully filing disclosures. Technology solutions must be combined with robust support services and change management practices to realize full and successful adoption. We believe that the rapid utilization rate for Passport and success of Accelerator represent sound design and ease of use, and more importantly, a responsive, customer-centered approach built on availability of tailored online user reference resources, hands-on help desk support, in-person training, and ongoing deployment of technical system enhancements. Since the launch of Passport, our online resources have been accessed roughly 16,000 times and our help desk has processed over 21,000 requests, requests for uh, personal support. Our extensive and responsive customer service support services and online technology solutions help to level the playing field for small organizations and those new to doing business with the city. Today, we are accessible whenever and wherever is most convenient for our vendors, whether a volunteer-based nonprofit or a large company with a dedicated government contracts team. MOC staff also design and host the Citywide Procure Procurement Training Institute, educating agency chief contracting officers and staff on procurement policies, procedures, and best practices. As municipal procurement practices continue to evolve, we are working to align our educational and advisory services to adopt industry-recognized best practices, learning from other government institutions and corporate partners. Partnerships across sectors and stakeholder communities are increasingly informing our work. In the human service sector, MOX project manages the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, a key partnership between approximately 20 city agencies and 100 nonprofits, representing the broad spectrum of human services the city procures. The NRC has helped to streamline administrative processes, implement new policies that increase provider cash flow, and ensure greater provider input on program design. MOX uses this collaborative model across multiple relationships to design and engage responsive procurement solutions. Earlier this month, 
Mox was proud to partner with city agencies and the mayor's office of MWBE on an innovative procurement method that implements a state authorized increase to the discretionary purchasing threshold for city certified MWBEs. This approach enabled the administration to respond quickly to this rule change and immediately expand MWBE engagement in city contracting. Accessibility, transparency, and accountability are critical to ensuring fairness in procurement. MOX further pursues these goals through centralized procurement data collection, analysis and reporting, offering a critical service to agencies, policymakers, vendors, and providers. To, co to continue the progress in each of, the, in each of our fo areas of focus, our administrative division works to ensure that we are optimally staffed and have a sufficient budget. Coordinating, coordinating across all division and with external agency partners, the team has onboarded 57 staff, staff since the beginning of the fiscal year and supported recruitment as we seek to hire for all open positions, including especially hard to fill technical positions. A major administrative priority is to ensure our team is appropriately housed. We are working closely with DCAS to achieve this goal in the coming months. Our move is especially critical now to stabilize operations and prepare to launch the next phase of Passport. The second phase will introduce centralized ordering and payment for goods citywide. I look forward to discussing our work and in the coming year providing you with updates on efforts to advance procurement transformation while maintaining fair and responsible processes. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I am joined by Ryan Murray, first Deputy Director at MOX, Victor Old, General Counsel, Jeremy Halbridge, Deputy Director of Administration, and Danielle Lewis, Associate Director of Finance and Operations. We're happy to take any questions that you have. Thank you, Dan. Um, staying with Passport, um, I know we said the first phase of Passport is complete. Final two stages will be completed over the next two years. Um, I guess, can you expand a little bit on the, the main, what you feel the main successes of Passport since the completion, and also, I guess, what your key performance indicators are to set, you know, how you define success with Passport? Sure. So uh, I think um, the main success uh, is obviously just reducing the paper from the process. Um, uh, ask any vendor that's done business with the city in the past. Um, it was very labor and paper intensive right. um, with filings ongoing. Um, and for each contract or award, uh, you would have to come in and if there were no changes to those filings, submit a, another piece of paper that said there's no change to the filings that I just uh, submitted to you months back. So just putting that online is a huge success, reduces a lot of burden for vendors. Um, and uh, subsequently, the ripple effect there is that it also reduces the time it takes. Um, in, the, in the past, you know, a pile of paper would come into MOX uh, that was filled out by hand mostly uh, by vendors, and then uh, MOX was taking that and entering it into a database, right? So a lot of fat fingering and uh, errors can occur there in, in that process. We've eliminated all that because now the vendors are accessing a public portal where they're answering the questions themselves and they're certifying to their truthfulness um, in the disclosure process. Um, we put all our resources online and so while we've, uh, the, the 16,000 hits essentially to our resource guide means that vendors are looking to the resources we've put online and using them to uh, successfully file their disclosures. And so the key indicator there is that they're not necessarily um, requiring a hands-on, one-to-one, in-person training in order to fill out their disclosures. Right. They're accessing the tools that we provide that are step-by-step -step guides, right? And they may have, they have questions, they reach out to our help desk um, and they receive help uh, in that way. Um, but they're basically doing it in, in a self-paced way. They do it as they need to. And a process that has, in, in the past, uh, in the paper process, taken roughly a month from the vendor submitting that paper to MOX fully filing that disclosure is now happening within a day for many providers. Um, it depends on the complexity of the vendor. If, uh, you know, a large corporation might take longer because there's a lot of information in those Vendex questions that they have to go and get. Um, but for a very simple, small organization, while the questions are not, uh, you know, uh, very intuitive, and that's what we spend a lot of time helping them with, 
uh, often, oftentimes it's a, it's a fairly streamlined process for them. Um, and it can happen within hours as opposed to a month. And so we think we're, you know, it, how the downstream effect of that is to be seen as we build out the future phases of Passport, but reducing down from one month to hours uh, is one key process indicator for us, as well as you know the access to the to the tools that we're providing. Right, um, this is you know it would be misleading to say that this is a technology project. As I mentioned in my testimony, this is far more about the support we give around the change that's happening. Right, moving from a paper process to a, a more digital process is requires some handholding, both for city agencies and vendors, and that's what we pride ourselves on. Yeah, yeah. Any 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 reform that is quantified by time saved for vendors is fantastic. So, um, I know you mentioned before the difficulty in in you know um, hiring some of the high level or the specific um, job roles in tech and, and that sort of thing. Um, but when it comes to customer service support for the system, how many uh, staff roles, positions are there for folks who are purely there to help vendors navigate that, that minefield? So I would say that um, all of MOX uh, is, is part of that support process. Um, and, and uh, you know, whether it's the legal team whether it's the, the front lines that helped us that first take that email that comes in from a vendor requiring help. Um, it could be a technical issue, so it's also the technical team. Um, it could be you know, part of the, 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 part, the, the policy and partnerships team that works with nonprofits specifically. And so while you have a, a team uh, on the help desk that I believe is roughly 20, 24, Right, those are fielding, and not just for Passport, for, but for HHS Accelerator as well. It's a it's a combined uh, support uh, model. Um, those questions and that help is fanned out across all of MOX, and so, uh, and and that's and that's what we uh, and that's what we talk about uh, as an agency is that our sole purpose is to facilitate this process for our vendors and for city agencies. So while we have a small, uh, you know, team that is dedicated the the first line of defense. Um, that, that support, uh, you know, uh, ripples out across the agency. Do you think 24 is enough? Uh, so it's enough right now. Um, we think that uh, it's enough to support what we're doing right now with HHS Accelerator and Passport. Um, and, you know, we're trying to be very smart about our growth. Um, we, don't, we don't ask for new needs that are two or three years away. I think it remains to be seen as release two and release three go live of Passport and gauging um, what those numbers ought to be. As far as um, tech infrastructure, I mean, does Passport have the capacity now to deal with all or the, you know, the, the historical amount of vendors we see every year? From a purely a technical perspective, yes, the, the system performance-wise has not, has not faltered at all. Okay. I'm not concerned about that. Um, we, I talked last time about, uh, and we had talked previously about uh, working towards a, a slower sort of growth rate, but it sort of spiked right at the very beginning. Um, the system took it like a champ, um, and I think you know, we've uh, worked very hard to stabilize the, the incoming volume that we've seen, and I, I, don't, I, don't, I think we're well prepared to, to take that on. Okay, I want to note uh, we've been joined by Councilman Yeager. Um, what uh, advertising passport, telling the world about it? Are we allocating any resources to that? We're not yet. Um, we haven't had to. Um, like I talked about, we went live in August, and there was an immediate spike of vendors uh, uh, that uh, accessed uh, their uh, existing vendors. Uh, not all, not all of our accounts are existing vendors. Um, I can get back to you on on the split between you know the nine thousand and the nine thousand who have accounts, six thousand are filed of whose. Does, ha does have a contract, who doesn't. Um, but I'm that just was thinking done. if there's vendors who maybe in the past were scared away by the bureaucracy, maybe they say, hey, it's a new day at Mox, we have this great yep. thing. It so could, so you know. Ryan Murray can talk a little bit more about the, the phased plan we have, um, but I don't know that we have a, a media campaign that's uh, quite necessary just yet. Okay. Good morning. Um, just to build on what the director was saying, I, I think our approach here 
it has been to work very closely with agencies to make sure that anyone who wants to do business with the city um, or is a current contractor who has to file um, so that they can do their background checks uh, in the first phase of passport are getting in. I think that's one of the vehicles that we've been really leveraging. Um, in the coming months, uh, what you'll note is that any RFP, any, any solicitation that's going out, um, one of the things that the agencies do a really good job at is telling any of those prospective bidders who find out about city contracting through a number of methods, right? Either the agency themselves, because they're focused on um, you know, education, childcare, um, or providing housing, or uh, they're looking at the city record online and looking for any of those opportunities. Those are the methods we wanna make sure that it's in context um, when you're doing business with the cities so that you get ready to do business, right? And that you file. So we've worked really closely with the agencies on that process um, and, and that's the approach that we're taking to make sure that folks are coming in when they need to um, and that when they're looking for opportunities, they're also aware that this is one of the steps that they can take and it's now easier. Yeah, I'm just thinking of you know something like what the state does, where the state is open for business, that kind of thing. I mean, some sort of advert. I mean, is there a budget for advertising, even if it hasn't been accessed yet? Or we don't have a we don't have a particular uh, uh, we don't have anything allocated specifically for advertising. Right. No, we have a small uh, OTPS budget that we could use for things like that. I think the most appropriate time for those kinds of things would be when. Passport is complete, or right before passport passport is fully sure. complete, because in that future phase, that open for business model is going to be something that we have, where on the passport portal you would have all of the existing contracting opportunities. We don't have that yet in one central place. That is one of right. uh, the the items and the modules that we would have in passport, and so that that would be you know that would dovetail nicely with a media campaign around cities open for business, right? That type of a model. But right now, all we can sort of sell, for lack of a better word, is come in and file your Vendex disclosures. For a brand new vendor, that's really only the, the yeah. you know, very small part of the a process. Very sexy ad campaign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, no, but look, I think, look, I think we're all here to, to you know, bust bureaucracy wherever we can. So um, if, if it went, if and, you know, when it is finally ready, I mean, to really spread the word is, I think, you know, I think, look, there's a stereotype out there that, and for, for good reason, some of it is that it's very hard to do business with the city and that it's difficult for small, uh, you know, groups to do business with the city. So if there's a way to say, look, it's never been easier, um, you know, I think that's beneficial on many levels, so. Yeah, I, I think you're, you're picking up on, on the intent here, right? We want to make sure that whether it's for Passport or Accelerator, we want to tell that good news, um, that it is easy to do business with the city and we're trying to make it easier. Um, our intent is to, to, to do that. We want to build on the success of this early uh, release for Passport, which is essentially for vendors who have to file, that they get in, they make sure that experience is wonderful and easy. Um, I think word of mouth should not be undersold that folks who are currently doing business with the city, if they're singing our praises, um, and showing that it is much easier, that that's also one major marketing uh, component. But as uh, the director said, I think we are looking to, to build success now um, and be able to, uh, for folks who are looking at those opportunities to do business with the city, understand all the requirements, um, and then it would be an easier process for them. So uh, more, more to come, I would say. Right on. I want to uh, acknowledge we've been joined by Councilman Perkins. Um, and before I, I turn to my colleagues, if they have any questions, um, the, the citywide savings plan for FY19 identifies uh, efficiencies for procurement reform totaling 20 million for FY19 and significant savings in the out years. Um, is MOX the, the lead agency responsible for coordinating this, this effort? Uh, that would be uh, through OMB, although we work with them regularly to identify areas, uh, functional areas that Passport would, you know, help uh, provide efficiencies in. Okay. So do we know, do you know if we're on track to, to meet these, these savings benchmarks? I don't have those specifics uh, with me okay. now, but I'm happy to coordinate a conversation with OMB. Um, I mean, besides the, the procurement reform, I mean, there are other procurement areas that can be approved upon, do you think, to deliver savings citywide? Um, well, so savings citywide, I'll sort of 
a hold for a, it's a separate conversation with OMB. Um, but there are tons of areas uh, in the procurement process. As I said, there is ample room for improvement. This is not just a technology uh, problem that Passport will somehow fix, right? It is, it is moving the, the procurement processes into, uh, into, into a, a digital platform that is accessible by vendors and city agencies. Um, it's the change management um, and support services necessary to move vendor staff and city staff in that direction. You have a lot of uh, staff for both vendors and city agencies that have been doing the same thing the same way in, for a very long time. And moving, it, it can't be uh, understated how important it is to move that workforce in this direction. Um, and we've done it well with Accelerator and, and, it's, and it's a much larger effort to do it citywide with Passport. Um, and so it's uh, that on the ground uh, thinking differently about procurement. Um, uh, and, and then the other areas are, you know, things like strategic sourcing, right? We, because of the lack of transparency into the process, a lot of, a lot of procurement work is meant managing uh, and moving the, uh, the next step in the process along um, instead of uh, where, you know, what agencies could do better of is thinking strategically about how they procure, what they buy and how they buy it. Um, and a, a technology tool allows you to think more critically about that. One way in which it does that is it breaks down the silos um, that our agencies uh, find themselves in today. Um, if you're you know, managing a paper process um, or, or a very manual uh, process, there isn't, a, there isn't a platform where your best practice, th and this agency's best practices are shared with another agency. Well, in Passport, now everything uh, uh, would be uh, wide open and viewable by other city agencies. You can leverage each other's work. You can leverage the, the contract and procurement templates that other agencies are using for similar goods and services. Um, and so those are the things that we're working on in parallel with Passport, which is you know, the things that sort of surround the technology, um, which are standardization, templatizing uh, documents and, and contracts and things like that. Um, every year, Mox publishes the uh, Agency Procurement Indicators Report. Um, although the report details procurement activity throughout the city in any given year, it does not include uh, one of the city's largest contracting agencies where I used to work at the DOE. Um, it, it, will Mox be including DOE in the FY18 Agency uh, Indicator Report? Yes. Okay. And what about uh, SCA? SCA, no, we have uh, no in intention of uh, including the school construction authority as part of the procurement indicators. Um, Has that been a discussion? Or? Uh, I have not had a discussion about the SCA being included. They're not under our purview. We don't have any interaction with their contracting processes at all. Um, open to a discussion, of course, but that's not something that we've talked about. Okay. Uh, my colleagues? Yeah? Okay. Um, the FY17 agency procurement indicator report says the city is actively looking to identify subcontract opportunities for MWBEs um, on the $2.75 billion contract with waste management. Um, can you speak a little to the, our progress in identifying these, sub, these MWBE subcontracts? So I know that the office of uh, the mayor's office of MWBE, led by Janelle Doris, has made some uh, uh, good headway with the uh, Department of Sanitation and the vendor for that particular contract in exploring uh, subcontracting opportunities. I don't have the details of you know uh, what the services are that they're looking at specifically, but we'd be happy to get back to you on that. But I do know that they've uh, they have cooperation from both the vendor, Department of Sanitation. They're working regularly together to identify subcontracting opportunities under that contract. So to that end, what is Mox's role in regard to um, those those subcontract like the provisions on large contracts? So Mox's role would have been prior to contract registration. So ensuring that the, uh, the procedural re requisites were followed for procuring that, uh, that good or service uh, uh, prior to registration. Post-registration, that the, you know, identifying subcontracts, approving subcontracts, that sort of lies uh, with the agency. Um, but obviously this was a key contract. It had an impact on the city's MWBE utilization rate, although for the first time ever, 
um, the city has spent over $1 billion on MWBEs in the prior fiscal year. While the, the rate was impacted because the denominator was increased because of that $2.7 billion contract, the rate, uh, rate was lower than we wanted it to be, but the overall spend for MWBEs reached $1 billion last year. And so that's what we're, what we're proud of. And um, now, did the prime contract specify like allocating a certain amount of subcontracts MWBEs? So the, the contract, the services at, at the time that the contract were registered, the prime, you know, there was no MWB capacity to deliver what the prime was delivering. Um, and so I think we're, uh, the sanitation and the mayor's office of MWB are trying to identify subcontracting opportunities where you can target MWBs. And I know that they've had success in identifying those opportunities. I just don't have the details on what they are, um, but we can follow up. Okay. One of the things we were speaking about with uh, Jarnell was the inability to capture once a contract goes deeper than a layer or two, that there may be MWBEs on these subs that we're not capturing, which I would, you know, for the city, I'm sure would love to capture those numbers. Um, I don't know if that would be picked up on anything that you guys have. So right now, uh, uh, re uh, the requirement is for providers to uh, identify their subcontractors in a, a system called the Payee Information Portal, or okay. PIP in FMS, um, but not subs of subs. Is that right? Um, and so, so it goes uh, one level, basically. It, go, it goes one level, that's right. Um, and the difficulty that the city has is that there is no, there's no tool. There, there, first of all, there's no contractual relationship, technically, between the, the, the city and the sub. There's, it's a city and the prime. Um, but in Passport, what we're hoping for in the future state is to be able, on a contract record, be able to identify the subs Right, and even be able to track some of the payments to the subs, which is also, I know, uh, uh, a difficult uh, part of uh, tracking uh, payments uh, that I know Janelle is very much focused on. Um, and so we're thinking about that as we, as we design the future phases of Passport, is how to better capture uh, subcontractors. Yeah, it's such an important piece. I mean, if we're missing even one or two, you know what I mean, anything we can to, to, if, to, to prove that we're doing better than people might think we're doing, you know. Right. Um, Staying with the DOE, um, I know at last year's preliminary budget hearing, um, Mox shared that uh, they're working to become more involved with DOE's procurement process and that DOE is interested in increasing opportunities for MWBEs. When we had the education hearing yesterday, I asked the SCA about this, and they actually have a fantastic record on, on MWBEs. Um, but with DOE, I mean, how far along is DOE, uh, you know, how far along are they be before becoming incorporated into Passport? Uh, so DOE is already using Passport okay. uh, in, in phase one because their vendors are required to file what used to be called Vendex as well. Um, and so they're already there. Um, and we have plans to, as we, we're, we're designing not just for the 40 mayoral agencies, but for DOE as well. That, that's part of uh, the passport plan is to roll them out to all phases of passport. And they are already included in uh, the first phase. St sticking with MWBs, do we know how many prime or subcontracts have been awarded from DOE to MWBs? I, I don't have those numbers on hand, but I can absolutely okay. get back to you. Um, let's do some local law 18 excitement. Um, how, how is, as far as the, the local law 18, people that know, provides a quarterly report, capital contracts valued at $10 million with a contract mod or extension that exceeds the original contract maximum expenditure by 20% or more. Um, I know Mox had previously testified and agreed to consider separating overruns that are expected uh, from the ones that require more immediate uh, attention, immediate action. Um, how are you currently using the, how is MOX currently using the, uh, the uh, cost overrun report? So uh, on a quarterly basis, and, and Victor can help fill in uh, any blanks that I leave, uh, but uh, on a quarterly basis, we're identifying those contracts that meet the criteria that you just laid out. Um, and we're 
using that as a flag, right? Any transparency is good. And so out of the thousands of contract transactions, it, it, it allows us to highlight a few that reach that criteria um, to sort of bring some light to the fact that this contract amendment or change order has occurred. It is retroactive, right? You're looking at it after the fact. Um, but we are taking that report, sharing it with the council as, as, as is required. We're also, I believe at the council's uh, request, sharing that with the agency commissioners that, uh, who, who, who have contracts that have found themselves on the report on a quarterly basis and highlighting it for them as well. I think, I mean, from what we've learned historically about contracts that typically, have we learned from contracts that overrun like indicators that we're heading in that direction? Is there more that's being done in real time intervention instead of just saying, well, it's an overrun, we have to deal with it. Is there anything we could be doing to say this thing looks like it's headed towards an overrun? So as we, as we pull that report together, um, uh, as you know, there's a, there's a section of the report that identifies the reason for the contract change. Um, if there was something in there that highlighted for us that you know something doesn't smell right, then obviously we're going to follow up with the agency and ask them to further clarify. And we do. And, and sometimes, that, not that they, things have not smelled right, but you know the description wasn't sort of clear enough for us to understand what the change was all about. Um, and so we've gone back and forth and made sure that they identify that very clearly on the report. And so that gives us, an, you know, it, it gives us an opportunity to work with the agency to get to the bottom line of what those uh, changes are. What I will say is that what's uh, sometimes lost in this discussion is the fact that a lot of projects that are smartly done are done on an iterative basis. Um, that while although you aspire for a, uh, a contract to be a, of a certain size, you might only contract the first part, right, or a small part, just like we've done with Accelerator and Passport. You know, we, we, uh, with Accelerator, we're now through release uh, we've done seven major releases, but we, we only contracted for the first and second release at the very outset, right? And we've built on, upon that project over time as we've needed it. Um, instead of trying to guess the scope out multiple years out, we've, you know, we, 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 uh, we were very clear about the size and scope of what we wanted to do at the very beginning, and then that's what we procured. And then as enhancements were required or different modules were required or different work, uh, different functions were required, um, then we went and, and we amended that contract to include those things. And so while a plain view of what the accelerator contract might be, you would say, oh my goodness, it, 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 you know, it, it's increased by X percentage. But in fact, it, it, it was just that we increased it as we increased the scope of work. Now, I'm not saying that every contract is like that. There are some true cost overruns that we need to look at. But I think what gets lost is the fact that many of our contracts are managed smartly, but there is an increase in scope. Good. Um, with discretionary funding in the council, um, what improvements has Mox made in, in, in that awarding process? So uh, in, in the past couple of years, I think there's, we've agreed with Council Finance to include uh, HHS Accelerator as a benchmark for nonprofits to be pre-qualified. It is one of the, the checks in the checklist of the vetting process. Um, I would say the, the, uh, the lion's share of the vetting uh, is contained within the council, yeah. but to the extent that it lives with MOX, we've leveraged Accelerator um, uh, to a great degree, and that, is, that has helped us tremendously. And I think, um, you know, it's, uh, it's, again, another process that has ample room for improvement, um, but I think uh, leveraging tools like Accelerator has helped uh, tremendously. And Do you, does MOX track the time between you know, uh, for a contract, a, uh, a discretionary award to clear versus register, how long that whole process takes? Um, that, that's something we could do. I mean, we have, we have access to the, the milestones that those things uh, achieve. That's something, that's something we could put yeah, It'd be together. interesting to know the average time between um, commencement of review and agency registration. Um, Um, I still have a couple of questions about change orders. Uh, according to 
the agency procurement report between FY16 and 17, the total value of construction change orders reduced from about 506 million in FY16 to roughly 252 million in FY17. Um, do we know what caused such a significant drop? I and mean, that's a substantial drop. So I, I think I think the, the the simple answer is that you know procurement is cyclical, right? It, it's not an indication of spend necessarily. The procurement indicators report of is what's procured in that year, um, and so a multi-year. Uh, contract would be counted once in that in a, in a procurement indicators report, um, and so it's not a it's not an annual spend report, it's an annual procurement report. So if I've procured something one year that's five years in length, it's going to show up in that first year and not the other four, and so uh, sometimes a drops in what's procured can be mis, uh, misled as uh, something that's actually spent, and that's not the case. But we can we can certainly look more at that and, and come back with details. Um, between, I, I want to say we're joined by Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal. Thank you. Um, between FY16 and 17, the total value of design change orders has increased from about 125 to 307 million. Um, uh, what factors drove up? that the, the design change that time so I, I, I would I would give pretty much the same answer okay. that it, it's it's it, on a case-by-case -case basis it's it's not uh, it, it, I don't have details on why that increase occurred but I would say that the procurement indicator isn't always the, the the greatest indicator of of spend it's more about what's procured at that particular that time in that it. fiscal year okay um, councilman Rosenthal you want to ask questions please just a few, and my apologies for being late, and it's well, great to see you at the helm, <laughs> council member. Good to see you guys. Um, I guess I, I really want to ask whether or not you feel you're well-staffed to do the work that you've been asked to do. Um, we've been talking about um, the, all the new uh, and, and vastly improved um, you know, what, what we would formerly call Vendex systems. And yet, I hear from so many providers that things are still slow, payments are slow, and it appears that, as I probe about it, it appears the source of the problem is that the people on the agency side, not MOX, not at all, or, sorry, at OMB or any of the other agencies, uh, the oversight agencies, but the um, agencies themselves, like at HRA or um, HPD or DYCD or aging, that they're not taking a cotton to the system. And when we talk about how many service providers we're training, I feel that we're, we still need to be reporting on the number of people we're training, training in the agencies and the success of that training. Um, so I was wondering if you feel that, how do we, is there, a, how do we deal with that problem? It, do we need more trainers at MOX to do this? So I, w we talked a little about that before. Apologies. No, that's okay. Uh, so um, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, the, where the source of MOX pride is not necessarily in the systems that we might implement that digitize the process and simplify the process, but in the change management that we employ to move vendors and city agencies in that new direction. Um, and so it is, a, it, it is the most powerful thing we do, right? It's, it's not just uh, moving them through that change, but supporting them through that change, answering every question they have. I think you're right. I think uh, the vendors uh, pick it up much quicker than the city agencies. Um, and it is a daily challenge for us to move agencies uh, in, in that direction. Um, what I would say is that Without, with, in the absence of an end-to-end -end process in which we have uh, the full transparency of all these transactions, it's difficult for us 
to um, combat some of the, okay, we, we've solved the Vendex problem, but it's still slow. Without having the full three releases of Passport live, um, it's tough for us to maneuver and, and move agencies in a direction at the micro level where, if, hey, I've got this one issue, I still have to go to the agency to find out what that issue is and then try to expedite it as best I can. Um, Ryan can talk a, a bit more about our, our change management activities on the ground, um, but uh, I, I totally acknowledge that there is, uh, there is um, ample room for improvement in all of our processes, but we are also hyper-focused on change, more than we are on, I, we are absolutely focused on uh, technology delivery, but it, the change that surrounds that technology delivery is equally, if not more important sure. to us. So one of the stats that you used to provide is number of employees in, in each city agency who need to be trained and the number trained. Do you still have that? Did you already review that, council member? No. So the I, number who yeah. still need to be trained. Well, I think, council member, um, one of the ways we talked about it a little earlier was uh, not just in the sense of how many folks are sitting in a classroom with us, um, but rather our access to material, so it's a continuum, right? We, one of the things that you're flagging, uh, just to take a step back, is that we have put tools in place, technology tools, to fix very specific parts of um, and painful parts of the procurement process. So just taking a look back, because we've had some of these conversations around Accelerator, right? Um, one of the first questions we got when we finally launched Accelerator, and that was the pre-qualification phase that we can now speak of in retrospect as great, that has re relieved a bunch of pain points in the discretionary process and so on. Um, the first question we got well, was, well, what about Vendex? And what are we gonna put that online? Because that process is still slowing down procurement. So um, moving forward to now, um, part of what uh, the director was hinting at is we're also putting another piece in place in terms of Vendex process and making sure that folks are able to file online and make changes online and that the agencies at and, and the same time are able to use um, that resource well. So on the specific I'll training. I'll do respect. I'll do respect. Sure. It just in the, in for the, just because time is short. Um, this is what I'm asking. If the deputy mayor, if the first deputy mayor were asking you, what are the top three agencies that are, are not fully trained yet? What would your answer be? So I think, uh, and I'm not trying to dodge the question, but I would reframe it. Um, we've put out um, materials. It's not a certificate. You don't, you're not getting certified in use of Passport and in or Accelerator. Way, I have but to be honest, the fact that you can't answer the question and just say, which is okay, which is just say A, B, and C tells me that um, you're doing a first pass with everyone. Um, you may be 100% done in your first pass, but there's not, you know, now you're maybe doubling back or not, but, you know, I'm interested in the quality reviews. So are there 10 people remaining at an agency who just aren't getting it? You, you've trained them once, they have a supervisor, but they're just not getting it. And that's what I'm interested in hearing. So but I, I, I would just say that we tackle those uh, on a, on a case-by-case -case basis, right? Uh, in the human services uh, arena, you know, I, I talk a lot about, you know, it's a constant game of whack-a-mole, right? We need, we need uh, the, the, the sector to alert us to issues that they might be having with an agency so that we can go and address it. Um, How many and, complaints and we do that, have but there, you gotten but in the last two months then from the advice I give to um, service providers is reach out to Mox. They have professionals who can help you walk through the service. So how many requests have you had like that in the last month, two months, however you track it? Uh, I, I, I don't have a specific Dozens number. Dozens or hundreds or it, five? It would not be hundreds. It would be, yeah, it might be in the dozen or so. And do you track that number over time and see whether or not, you know, you're doubling down and helping you know, that's when you have the opportunity to identify, oh, that agency is still struggling. So I wouldn't say that it's an exact number as an indicator that we use, 
right? We have our feelers out there and we work with agencies all the time. And when we notice that, you know, there's a particular amount of activity on a certain agency or a certain function within one of our systems, then we know we have to target resources at that agency and get in there. And sometimes we've co-located at that agency. We've actually sort of just walked in and sort of sat with them to make sure that that process gets better. Um, I'm not saying that we've fixed it in, in entirety, and there are absolutely okay. staff out there Thank at the you. city agencies. I appreciate that. Okay. I really do. I really do. And then just my last question, because I don't want to take up your time, is um, through uh, Passport, are you able to track the number of bidders on uh, general construction projects? So, no. Thinking of larger projects, this, and the, the genesis of the question is, one of the things we're un, unraveling about the MTA cost overruns, it, it, they're not overruns at all. The fact that they only have one or two bidders means that the bid itself is already loaded with padding. And I'm wondering, um, you know, when I spoke about this to Polly Trottenberg at DOT, she said she was in fact, you know, aware of that type of issue and trying to build certain um, sectors like road painting sector in order to get more bids. So I'm just wondering um, if we can use Passport as a tool to quickly identify whether or not there are many or, or not so many bidders on projects. So with phase one, phase one of Passport is, is just having put Vendex online. So we don't have procurements running through Passport yet. That is, that is the plan and when we do that, vendors would be submitting their bids and proposals through the system and so we right. would absolutely know the number. What's we know that number that? in Accelerator because that's where they're submitting right. their proposals. And that's so not that, where that's, the problem is. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's an easy problem to, to fix in a future state. Right now, to know the number of bids, we would have to, you know, we're relying on the agency to tell us. That's a number that's ob obtainable. Like, uh, half a year, a year? Do you have a timeline for uh, getting all the bidding through Pro uh, Passport? So uh, the, the phases of Apologies Passport, again. that's okay, the phases of Passport will roll out over the next two years. Okay. Um, and so we, 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 have, we anticipate having some sourcing uh, in the next release, but uh, the following release is where, uh, when we would have bids and proposals flowing okay. through. Okay, thank but, you very much. But that much. number of bids is obtainable if we need to know it. That's good to know. Just not through, uh, a, you know, a digital Got process. Got it. Thank you so much. Just for my own edification, the different phasing and the staggering of the phasing, what, what's that about? Are we waiting? Are we still creating it? What are we doing? Uh, it, with Passport? Yeah. Yeah, so right now we're in, uh, we're in design of release two, and so it sort of, it goes through a design phase, then a build phase, and then, you know, testing phase, and then, and then you launch. Okay. Um, and so right now we're in design of release two, and we need that kind of runway uh, in order to release the functionality. Got it. Okay. Um, getting back to um, the um, local law 18 stuff, I, w I mean, I was okay with with your explanation. It makes sense to me, but I I'm interested to know what some of the agencies are saying uh, w with that explanation. Are they pushing back on that, or are they pushing back on which part? Sorry, uh, uh, on just that you you're saying that as far as change orders, that it's not indic it's not indicative of any sort of you know loss or, or it's just it's just indicative of what procurement is out there, how many fish are in the sea, right? So, are the agencies agreeing with that explanation? Well, I, it depends on on it, for a for a contract that fits that criteria where there is actually an increase in scope and not necessarily a quote unquote cost overrun, then I, I would assume that they would agree with me. But in a case where there would be a cost overrun, then you know I, I think they would. Uh, you know, agree that it that it is, and there are factors that lead to that. I don't, you know, I don't think the agency. I think the agencies share um, that they would share in that uh, the explanation I provided um, on a case by case basis. Perhaps not, but I think overall, I think my my point was that um, I think what gets lost in the conversation is that every increase is a cost overrun, and I'm just trying to indicate that that's not necessarily the case if you are iterating on the rollout of a particular project and adding scope all along. Yeah. Now, I'm not looking to demonize overruns. I mean, I get it. Um, sure. um, contracts that are valued at more than $100,000 must be reviewed by OMB and the, and the city law department. Um, and then those, those vendors have to be reviewed by DOI. 
Um, do we know how many of these contracts like this were flagged for any concern in FY17 or, and then how many were not registered as a result? Uh, that is that is something we can certainly look back look at and, and, and get back to you. Okay, that'd sure. be interesting to know. Um, and how often are contracts being reviewed before they go to the controller's office, but after they leave the agency? How often are they reviewed? Uh, so depending on the criteria, um, uh, they would all be reviewed. Right, so before they go to the controller. Before they go to the controller, I mean, it, right? It depends. Some, some based on dollar amounts uh, might not require MOX or law or OMB review uh, because that authority's been delegated, and it would, you know, it would be from the agency straight to the controller's office. But based on, uh, you know, dollar amount, sometimes the type of commodity ser or service it is, then it goes through a various review processes. It's not if it was a, it's it's not a simple answer. For you know, for every single contract, it goes through the same process. Um, that's partly why there's ample room for improvement and automation here. All right, guys, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Oh, you do? Okay, Councilman Perkins. I'm sorry. Get, get some clarification on this nonprofit resiliency committee. Sure, so the nonprofit staffing and what, what's happening with that? Uh, so for, uh, for, from the, a budget perspective, there was one uh, additional headcount added for that purpose, for MOX, um, and MOX project manages the nonprofit, uh, nonprofit resiliency committee uh, for, the, for the mayor's office. Um, it's, uh, it's led by city hall uh, and, and deputy mayors. Um, but project managed by MOX um, in partnership with OMB and roughly 20 city agencies. Um, and there's a committee of roughly 100 nonprofits. Um, and it's a mechanism for um, identifying uh, issues with the nonprofit sector that they want to raise with us, particularly around finance or contracting processes. What's that mechanism, man? How does that interaction take place? Um, so we have various work groups. Um, of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee that meet regularly, um, and the committee itself uh, meets uh, roughly quarterly. Cool. So is there any uh, information you can share, like a report or some kind of understanding about how this is uh, actually being carried out? Absolutely, we have a, a page on the MOX website dedicated to it, um, but we can, if there's any, we can send you that, obviously, and then- Send me whatever you can towards that end. Will do. Thank you. Councilman Rosenthal? You know, uh, I'd like to follow up on your question, Councilmember Perkins. Um, in the first year of the Resiliency Committee, there was a lot of hope, and um, I think there were a couple of things that were accomplished. Do you uh, expect that in this coming year that the Resiliency Committee will be as dedicated and are, you know, meet as frequently as it did in its first year? Well, I certainly hope so. MOX is committed. Um, I hope the nonprofit sector sees that commitment and is willing to work with us as much as we're willing to work with them. Um, we've, uh, we've achieved a quite a lot. Um, we have a series of, uh, you know, successes and implementations that um, did not exist before the NRC was created. Um, this year, we're uh, implementing a streamlined budget modification process. This is a bit in the weeds, but nonprofits know what we're talking about. Um, we, uh, we got a, uh, we standardized a 25% cash advance, which we've talked about in the past, uh, among uh, other improvements around the audit process. Um, and so MOX remains committed. Obviously, there's been one headcount added for that purpose to help us out. Um, but, you know, we, uh, we, are, we are absolutely there at the table, ready to do that work. Um, that wasn't quite the answer I was looking for. So, but that's okay. Is the headcount filled? I know, understand you have a position. Uh, yeah, no, I, think it, I think it's posted, not, not filled. Excuse me? It's posted, the position is posted. Is it filled? Not filled, it's, right, the, the. Has it ever been filled? It's a brand, new, we're adding one headcount to oh, Mox's budget. For? For the purpose of supporting yeah, the NRC. Yeah, yeah. I think and that's, that's what started Council mid Perkins. this fiscal year or it's for next fiscal year? Uh, yeah, 
I think your, your question is, so we've had staff to work on the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee uh, at MOX, and that we've, we've been creating. the project manager. We've added scope to that work in terms of additional work groups, which we've added a staff person to help coordinate that work as well. Right, but the staff person hasn't been hired yet. The staff, right. no, we're going through the hiring process. We, right, yeah, got we have it. A, we have and a there's money in the budget for FY7, uh, 18 or 19? So there's the additional, the, the additional, additional bump money. up staff person. So a uh, full year's value was added to FY19 with a small portion in 18. Yep, that's, and that's so fine, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, the frequency of meeting in fiscal year um, 18 versus fiscal year 17. If we were to say you had 100 meetings, and I'm totally making this up, I just want to get a sense. If you had 100 meetings in fiscal year 17, would you be plus or minus 10 in fiscal year 18? So I think the, the number of work group meetings we have uh, so, so Let me put it a top. different way. Okay. I'm hearing from the um, human sector services uh, that the number of meetings has declined, and um, they're hoping that there will be another big push. I don't doubt your commitment. I don't sure. doubt the accomplishments you've made. And in fact, it's really a question that zeroes in on, given the accomplishments of this group and this, what you've put together, it's all the right people. Is that, you know, I don't want to see that fade away. It's great you've made three accomplishments. Are you in it to make three more? There's an endless number of accomplishments to be made. I think sure. the, the answer is that absolutely. Um, I, if you're referring to the frequency of meetings of uh, the executive directors and so on, I, I believe, uh, if my notes are correct, the meetings were on a quarterly basis. Um, for the last fiscal year, and we've gotten to a point where a lot of that work is being pushed to the work groups um, to continue, and the frequency of that work is going to continue at a high level. I think there, it's going to be uh, going to be like every there might be three or f three meetings as opposed to four in the next fiscal year, but there's still going to be many work group meetings happening. Okay, my colleagues. Okay, thank you guys very much. Thank you. Okay, we have five people on the next panel. We have uh, Michelle Jackson from Human Services Council, Andrea Sanfrani from Live on New York, or Live on, <laughs> Live on New York, Carlin Cohen from CAPC. I can't read this. What is it? Tawaki Kamatsi and Monsignor Kevin Sullivan. Okay, guys, Michelle, you want to start? Good morning. Um, my name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Director and General Counsel for the Human Services Council of New York. I want to thank the Council and Chairperson Brannon for allowing us this opportunity to testify today. The Human Services Council is a membership association of human services nonprofits. We represent about 170 direct service providers and coalitions in New York City, and we do policy and advocacy on behalf of the sector. 
will be testifying today, um, and then my colleagues will kind of fill in some of the details about some of the subsector issues that, uh, that we're all working together on. Uh, before I get to my written testimony, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Mayor's Office of Contract Services and the amazing partnership that they have with the, with the human services sector overall. They have done really revolutionary work. Um, as Dan mentioned, things like Passport, HHS Accelerator has been really game-changing for the sector. They have amazing customer service skills and they're putting a lot of time into the nonprofit sector. And we also really appreciate the work of the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee. It's done a lot of really granular level changes, some stuff that's never gonna make the front page <laughs> of any newspaper, <laughs> um, like budget modifications, audit changes, um, but it really makes a difference to the nonprofit sector and our ability to deliver quality services. So you're saying I'm just, I'm just being mean then? No, you were being great. You were lovely. <laughs> I mean, we always want more, right? But they, I just have to acknowledge that they've done a lot of really, of really great work and, um, and will continue to, to partner with us in, in next year on the work. Um, so this is a what have you done for me lately town, and we take pride in that. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, speaking of that, <laughs> now to what we're asking for this year. Um, you know, we've been really able, uh, working with the mayor's office and with the agencies and especially with council support, have been able to chip away at real decades of underfunding and process issues that keep the sector from preventing quality services um, to communities. And last year we had a historic um, investment with the thanks of the, of the council, $300 million that went to support an uh, increase in indirect funding, in cost of living for our adjustments for our workforce, and in model budgets in five different uh, program areas to really delve into some of these underfunding issues. That was a real historic investment and it makes a big difference. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our providers are reporting that that money, it's March, a lot of the money from those have, you know, in those contract amendments have not gone out yet. And that creates more cash flow issues for the sector uh, and also a lot of administrative headaches and even morale issues. For, for example, the cost of living adjustment, a lot of providers aren't able to give it out until they get those. Um, amendments from their agencies. So we'd like to work with the council and with the mayor's office to find other ways to speed that process up and to have more accountability to make sure that if we are able to get more increases, there's a COLA next year, that that, that money goes out quicker um, to agencies or to nonprofits. Um, also this year, we'd like to continue. It's not just about getting more money into the budget for the sector. It's also about standards in these contracts. So we'd like to see a 15% standard indirect rate on all the contracts. Indirect, least sexy issue. <laughs> but it's really about keeping the lights on. It's about having good accountants. It's having about IT. And when you strip away indirect funding, you prevent providers from really doing all of that risk assessment and good management that they need to do. We'd also like to see a 37% standard fringe rate on contracts, not being able to pay for health insurance and um, raises and quality staff really makes a difference at these organizations. And some of the RFPs that we see come out and contracts have kind of arbitrary fringe rates. 37% is a national standard, so we'd like to at least see that on contracts. Um, to continue to chip away at some of these underfunding issues, we'd like to see a 10% increase for contracts. Uh, so this is money on uh, both the insurance, like, um, casualty and liability insurance, and also occupancy costs. A lot of these contracts go on for at least 10 years, sometimes longer, and they don't have cost escalators. Rent goes up in New York City <laughs> every year, <laughs> as we're all very well aware. And some of these contracts go on you know, beyond their first RFP life um, and get extensions, and there's just not a way to account for that. And the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee, one of the work groups has actually picked up looking into insurance and also occupancy costs. and. You know, we, and we recognize that there's real increases there, and so to help kind of chip away at where some of these contracts have stagnated, we'd like to see an increase in that. So we estimate it'll be about $200 million to get some of these increases in this year's budget, uh, along with kind of standards and principles to hopefully move the money through quicker. Um, so I'll stop there. I'm happy to answer questions that you have, or, you know, and my colleagues can also fill in some of the color from their agencies. Um, thank you. Um do you feel Passport is or is going to be as fantastic as everyone says it is? I do. So I'm a procurement nerd myself and was <laughs> very excited about Accelerator and we worked very closely with the mayor's office to see Accelerator through and that's been really game changing for yeah. providers. I think to your point too about smaller providers have now have the same opportunity to compete that a lot of larger organizations do because they're all putting their information in in the same place one time. And Passport, Vendex has been one of the major headaches of the sector for years. And so even that getting it online is already, like people clapped and people are very excited in the nonprofit sector for that. And also to the you know, extent that there's better tracking mechanisms for contracts um, and more connectivity and procurement, online procurement will make a big difference. 
So what's the biggest challenge? I think the biggest challenge the sector is facing now is that the agencies, you know, getting the money out the door on these, we were really successful and, and, and ran this great campaign last year to get $300 million and providers haven't seen a lot of that money. Um, it makes, it's a, it's a real problem because it also shows some of the cracks with how agencies either relate to each other, how they relate to mayor's office directives, and also how they relate to providers to get that money out the door and kind of where those, there's obviously a huge slowdown and it, it also creates more issues for nonprofits, not just in terms of cash flow. A lot of providers, 30% have less than one month cash flow. So when you're waiting nine months for an amendment, it makes a big differ difference, but it also kind of creates a, does anyone know what's going on <laughs> um, and where, you know, where, you know, where does the buck stop, who's in charge, and how do we move things forward? Um, have any of the provi providers you're, you work with um, access the returnable grant fund? A lot of them do, yes. Okay. Um, a lot of them do multiple times, you know, throughout the year, especially the homeless services providers. In the last couple of years, that's been, uh, um, you know, a really important uh, piece for them. And actually, in the last couple of years, it's been the first time that it's hit um, its capacity. You know, the first couple of years it was there, it was $20 million, and a lot of it was always there. Um, in the last couple of years, it's actually been tapped out a couple of times. Yeah. And uh, we see it growing, and it's, it seems like something we'd want to work towards making obsolete. Yeah, I think it's a Band-Aid, right? Like, it's the idea that if contracts were paid on time, we wouldn't need a returnable grant fund. And so um, to the extent that Passport and other agency mechanisms can be put into place so that um, there's less need for it, that would be ideal. And as the city doesn't extend money lightly, if it's extending money through the returnable grant fund, then why isn't it just approving the contract? That would be my question. I mean, I think These there's the always delays. These are life's mysteries. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I think there's always going to be some sort of delays, but I think that to the extent that we've seen an increase in a lot of delays in contracts, it's become a real problem. Yeah. Okay. My colleagues? Okay. Thank you very much, Michelle. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Andrea Chanfrani. I'm the Director of Public Policy at Livon, New York. And in my new lifelong dream of becoming a procurement nerd, I have learned that I need to always follow Michelle because she um, lays it out very well and I can fill in some of the pieces and I don't have to do much in the way of explaining. But I will try to give some context. Um, oh, Are you, uh, what is your name again? Andrea Chanfrani, Livon, New Andrea. York. Andrea? Chanfrani? C-I-A-N. <laughs> Spell it for me, please. I C I A N F R A N I. China Franny. You got it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I am the director of public policy at Live On New York, um, a member so membership organization representing 100 community based agencies that serve 300,000 seniors annually through senior centers, case management, home delivered meals, NORC's housing, and many other services, many most contracted through the City Department for the Aging and other city agencies. Um, we're here today. We presented our DIFTA focused uh, budget priorities last week at the aging hearing, um, but we're really um, pleased to be here today and, and thank you for the opportunity to talk about some of these very issues and give context to the issues that Michelle was just referencing. Um, because what it really comes down to our members that we represent is them having the ability to maximize and um, ensure that they have provide the best service delivery as possible to the seniors that they serve. And a lot of the issues that, that Michelle raised and challenges that nonprofits face really impact that day-to-day -day service delivery. Um, and I do also want to, um, uh, um, to recognize the work of MOX um, and the NRC as well. Um, we've done a lot of different advocacy across the years that live on New York, but I think the most excited emails I got were over the past year when members were saying they don't have to drag down eight copies of contracts anymore, um, sign contracts, and are able to do things through email. So those um, you know, day-to-day -day efficiencies and, and um, making things easier for nonprofits who are doing a lot of different things day-to-day -day really matter. Um, and so we, we commend those, those efforts as well. Um, again, we're really here to, to echo what, what Michelle said, but um, city contracting, we're really focused on ensuring flexibility, transparency, responsiveness, and accountability in the, as core principles, because it's crucial to ensure that uh, seniors can um, serve older adults through the contracts that they um, contract with the city. We are part of the Human Services Advancement Strategy Group um, who are working on these issues and again we commend and thank the City Council for your work and support last year in securing the uh, nearly 300 million of the 500 million dollar ask for various areas to help support nonprofits. Um, there are two areas that we again are bringing special attention to in FY19 and it's um, the 
setting the floor of the 15% for indirect and all human service contracts, as well as the 10% increase um, in occupancy and casualty and liability insurance, um, and also asking, again, for that 37% um, industry standard for fringe benefits. Again, these are, um, you know, issues that affect the ability for um, an executive director, a senior center director, whatever it might be, to um, make sure that their employees are receiving what they need to be able to serve seniors serve seniors well. Another um, quick issue I wanted to raise that we raised at the aging committee last year, again, is the idea of fully funding contracts and the city needing to fully fund contracts. And one quick just um, area that I'd highlight as an example, in our budget ask, we do have um, a request for an increased uh, rate for meals for both home delivered and um, congregate meals, and that's because right now um, senior service or senior centers and home delivered meal agencies are providing these services and are not being um, reimbursed for the full price of the meal. So it's it's simple things like that that seem pretty um, straightforward and common sense, but that's why we're here to say that you know if agencies, nonprofits are doing these incredible services, which we know they are, and they can maximize the the effect of these, they need to be fully reimbursed for the meals that they're providing. They're providing you know at different rates, especially for culturally appropriate um, meals as well. And so these are just some key areas that we're foc focusing on in our advocacy, and we really appreciate the ability to talk through them with you. And you know just in closing, Live on New York, as well as many of the colleagues here, see ourselves as, as a partner with the city and really working to, to increase, you know, all these great services that we know um, are really important to keeping our city and making it a great place to age. So thank you. Right on. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a line as chair, I think, of all of my colleagues have to straddle is that the majority of, of vendors are doing, you know, in priceless work for the city. So even as we're trying to root out fraud and waste and that kind of stuff, it, you know, it's, it's the, the overwhelming majority of folks are, are like you guys who are doing great stuff. So I don't want to ever demonize uh, that, that part of it. Um, what's the biggest, the same I asked as Michelle, what's the biggest challenge or what's something you would fix if you were the head of Mox? I mean, I really think, again, it is, and again, not to echo everything Michelle said, but she's very smart, but um, it is the, um, you know, the flow of money into the agencies. I mean, I just think from a personal level, when you don't know when money is coming or when you're trying to be planful and innovative as a nonprofit in the city, there's a lot of incredible things to do, especially with all the momentum seniors bring to the city and, and really incredible things that we can, um, that our providers want to offer and can offer. But if you're, you know, sitting in an office trying to plan out, you know, pay Role for the next month, you're you're not able to do that. You're not able to innovate. You're not able to think, you know, five years ahead, ten years ahead, and looking at, you know, the the demographics with aging as it changed. You know, we had a membership meeting in November to pull together our members to really say, listen, what do you see is the future for the city and aging services? Um, you know, and sometimes with all of the things that are going on and these issues that we talk about um, that are difficult for nonprofits, the energy in that room was unbelievable. You had about, you know, nearly 80 senior center directors coming to talk about what they envision for the future and how they can serve older adults. And um, it, it's amazing. But they need the ability to have stability within their payrolls, within their programs, and know where that money is and when it's coming. Um, and if it's not coming, at least know that and, and be able to be planful, because otherwise they can't they can't innovate and they can't move forward. So I think it's really the flow of money and the communication, again, which I think is being worked on and creating those efficiencies that allow them to do the real day-to-day, -day, which should be serving seniors. And has it gotten better or is it still unpredictable? I think it's, I think, you know, I was noting, I was looking through, um, you know, just small things, not small, but um, important things like the uh, MOX updates and newsletters. Again, we hear, if I know or if I understand what's happening in the process or if I know where the contract is, and I think some of those um, issues have gotten better. I think there's been improved, um, you know, kind of communication and, and, again, through, you know, the NRC and different ways that the city is looking to increase that communication. I think that's been helpful. Um, and, again, efficiencies there you know, small, it seemed like small things, but they make a big difference to an executive director who's wearing, you know, a hundred different hats at a senior center, not having to come down to the city to, you know, hand deliver signed contracts and being able to get things mailed to them. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that we are also trying to do a good job of reaching out 
to city agencies such as Moth, such as um, you know, different contracting um, people along the way so that we can make sure they know us and that we're a resource for them and we can kind of have this two-way street of communicating information. So I think, you know, again, we're all in it together and um, there's pieces we need to address through the budget, through whatever it might be, but I think we, you know, we share the goal of, of moving forward. Councilman Perkins? So, so you're, you're, did you say you're not fully reimbursed for the meals you're providing? I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I couldn't hear you. Did you say you're not fully reimbursed for the meals you're providing? No, so the, um, the issue is, um, and meal reimbursement's a little- No, so you said it, or no, you didn't oh, say no, it? Oh, no, I did. They are not fully reimbursed. So they're, the, the price that they receive, and there hasn't been an increase in meals um, in several years. I'll have to look back. Um, the city hasn't increased the reimbursement rate. Um, so, and obviously food costs continue to go up. So they should be fully funded to cover the entire cost of the meal and, and cover and what is the gap percentage-wise, do you think, or so, dollar-wise, perhaps? Yeah. So there's, the gaps um, range anywhere. There's, the reimbursement rates are different um, per center, and it oh. depends. Um, so the reimbursement rates, I believe, are anywhere from $3 up, upwards of $18. There was a recent report that had some um, stats in there. So they're all over the board. Um, again, the, the reimbursement rate right now is, um, for the meals, is just not covering what the full cost of the meal is. So there's a range and we can. So there's a range between the groups in terms of the cost, mm -hmm. but in every case, it's not enough. It's not enough. And especially when we're talking about culturally appropriate and, um, and culturally appropriate, like uh, mm -hmm. kosher meals, halal meals that are, that are more exp um, you know, expensive to provide. Um, and you know, it's really important, especially because centers and programs are. But do the centers, sort of more or less quantify that and somehow other communicate that in terms of, by the way, we're not getting enough. I think so, and I think that's our role each year at the budget to um, present the information and talk about it to, to ensure that those reimbursement rates continue to go up to provide. What, what is the gap, would you say? I mean, the, what we are asking for to start addressing the gap um, is a dollar increase in meals for this year. So that comes out to about $12 million total of an ask. Why not $2? Um, we would be fine with that as well. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're trying to be reasonable and trying to address this, um, you know, in an, in an incremental way to, it to increase reasonable it. to bargain from a higher number uh, okay. than a lower number. <laughs> Point well taken. <laughs> okay. So uh, in, in, your, in, in, in that regard, though, how well are you communicating above and beyond us that this gap is, is, is critical? I mean, I, th I think that's a great um, question, and I think we do work regularly um, working with DIFTA and talking with the Department for the Aging to raise these issues and, and have a very good working relationship. Again, our members um, contract through DIFTA, and we, we work on these issues and make sure that we, as a collective voice, um, you know, live on New York. Again, we have 100 members that are running, uh, you know, a good majority of the 249 DIFTA contracted senior centers throughout the city. So we serve as a collective voice to hear that information, try to, um, you know, make it a uh, it, collect it and be able to relay those concerns. You know, we have, um, you know, a provider committee where, that we pull together once a month to really talk through these um, issues. Sometimes one center might be having an issue that's really focused on that center and it's not necessarily a systemic issue. I mean, that's something that they can work with, you know, their program officer or with DIFTA through. Um, but really our role is to understand these systemic issues that are rising, you know, for the collective um, group and to bring that both to the council, to bring it to the administration, and to work with our members to help um, you know, solve these, these challenges. We shouldn't be stingy to our seniors. We it's agree. It's not a good message. We agree. For the we like to talk about the incredible work that seniors are doing um, today for the city and in the state, uh, volunteering in, in, you know, in the thousands, they're caregiving, they are um, powering up the economies. If you, um, on May 9th, you will be getting an invitation soon for our Senior Advocacy Day, where you know, 300 seniors will be outside talking about the importance of funding senior services. So um, I fully agree, and I thank you for that, that comment. So if there's any other information that you can share with us that we can be useful with, Please hope don't, don't hesitate. We will be happy to. Thank you. Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to pick up on a little bit of what Councilman Perkins was asking with the, not, and not to be flippant, I know he wasn't either, but when you're talking about the reimbursement rate for the meals, um, you're, you know, the idea is that the nonprofits are filling a gap that the city itself is not providing. That's the purpose of these contracts. It's because the city doesn't have 
a dining room that it prepares foods and gives it out to random places and people. So therefore, we as a city have contracted with various entities, 249 uh, senior centers, but many more because there are Meals on Wheels programs and uh, soup kitchens and things of that nature. So the idea is that the city is supposed to, I understand charity is supposed to raise the money, and but that's for charity. This is, you're doing a service for the city. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you should be getting the actual cost of what it is. And um, I'm, I'm going to leave aside the, the cost of the fringe and the cost of the personnel and the cost of, you know, the operating expenses, but the actual buying the food and the cost of the food and the people who are giving out the food. So you, the contracts that you're responding to the RFPs for are undercutting you. They're understating the cost. And you're responding to the RFP and you're saying, yes, we, this great organization, who we are, you and uh, Chinese American Planning Council, Monsignor, Catholic Charities, you're all saying, well, we can do this service. But the problem is not really on the, on the uh, management of the contract. It's the fact that DIFTA itself is not putting out an RFP that is properly stating what the cost is. They, they should know, right, what the cost is. You're telling them. I guess it's a question a little bit. I think that's fair, and I think, again, that's what we're working towards. And, um, you know, we know that that system needs to be um, looked at, and, and, you know, there's a lot of different issues that go into food. There's foods broken up into raw food, and there's all different kind of pieces of it, so it's not completely straightforward, but I think I, you know, I agree. We, that's something we are working towards, and we're working with, you know, with everybody, with our members to get that information so that we can be clear in what is needed. Um, looking at national trends and, and other, you know, reimbursement rates and um, averages, looking at the cost of food going up. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's complicated, but I think, you know, I think that's true, and I think we're trying to make sure that we have good information to help in that process. Right. When you say that, uh, there's a range of prices. Some age, some organizations are paying three dollars a meal. Some organizations are paying eighteen dollars a meal. Can you just briefly explain. Well, they're that? not paying. It's the the reimbursement rates range. Um, and again, it's why is I mean the reimbursement rates set by the agency ranges. So on some contracts, the agency will say we're going to pay this senior center three dollars a meal, and some contracts the. Yeah, there's budgeted units, there's different costs, there's different vendors, there's, you know, so there's different um, costs that they're paying um, by the programs, and so there's ranges along the board that... Uh, with with, res with, with uh, the exception of the, of the different kinds of food, special dietary needs, kosher and halal, um, uh, uh, health needs, other than that, a, a potato is a potato, mm -hmm. cost the same. Um, well, I think in, in different areas, different vendors are used, and also, you know, there's different economies of scale. If you're, you know, providing for a center that has less people, you might be, um, you know, there's there's different ways that, to purchase food as well. So there's, you know, that's a challenge, too, to look at, um, you know, that's why there's all, you know, there's there's different. Okay, so, and this question is uh, not just for you, but also uh, for if Monsignor and uh, uh, Ms. Cowan, if you can address this when you testify, but how do you get to the point where if you, if, you know, you have a contract and it's supposed to give you $1,000 a year, but it really costs you $2,000 a year? Where do you get that $1,000? So, I mean, we kick in some money in member items, but it's tiny. It's nothing. Where does, where does that difference come from? I'm just asking, I mean, is it fundraising? Is it, is it, uh, um, is it going back to the city and saying we have, to, we have to deliver less meals because what you're giving us is not really covering the, the number of meals in our contract? What is the... Yeah. So we did this research, on, and you know, first of all, the answer is it varies, but we did this research with our membership after FEGS uh, went under, uh, largest human service provider at the time in the city, and had a $20 million deficit, declared bankruptcy, and completely shuttered. And we're seeing that as a rising trend in the sector. And well, it's, it's only a rising trend for the organizations that steal. That's, that's a different... Uh, that's, well, FEGS, okay. that's, yeah, that's, you know, right. that's, there's that to the side. But FEGS right. was you know, running a deficit, and because they were taking on a lot of the contracts, the underfunded contracts that other eight groups couldn't take, they thought they could because of an economy of scale. I mean, and not to cut you off, but the issue with FEGS is that they were deliberately undercutting other agencies when they would bid on contracts, knowing that, that these contracts, that they were going to get a contract because they were going to come in at the low number, and procurement rules are procurement rules, we've got to give it to the low guy, and they were, they were basically, they had a, a Madoff-like scheme uh, where they were, yeah, I could say it, it's, it's, it's all right, I'm, I'm a lawyer, I'm okay with being sued. Um, they, they had a Madoff-like scheme where they were taking from one pocket, paying from the other pocket, and, and they, were, they were understating the costs of a lot of these contracts. Uh, therefore, 
um, you know, kind of you were stuck with that, right? So when they all went out and all these contracts are available, and Monsignor's nodding his head because he's been doing this for a long time and he knows that this is exactly what was going on. And those of us who have watched that organization in particular, I'm not on an attack phase against them, but for the number of years that we have, always wondered how it is possible to do what it is that they say they're doing for the prices that we knew that were in their contracts. It was simply not fathomable. I've worked for nonprofits in my life. Um, and it was never possible. So that's a that's a FEGS yeah, separate. But what aside, FEGS did to you guys is FEGS kind of lowered the bar so low that you're stuck with contracts with with numbers that just simply are not. Yeah, matchable. well, I think it cuts across the you know the sector. A lot of the contracts that are underfunded, they've been underfunded for decades, and um, there's not a lot of collaboration between nonprofits providing those services on the ground and the agencies. When the RFPs are developed, um, we're working on that, and the NRC is actually actively working on that. The idea I, that since it's I'm, I'm sorry, I don't, but what do you mean when you say you're working? This is not a, you know, and this is not a fault of yours and that you created. But when you say what you're working on, can you tell us you know yes, briefly because course, I don't want to. But what do you mean? Is there a way that we can help? Is there a yeah, way so that the, the chair the can do something? The resiliency to committee has created. A collaborative program design. One of the barriers to kind of collaboration has always been a lot of myths around the procurement process of when you can talk to providers who may be competing for some of these contracts. And a lot of it is steeped in myth. It's not reality. Steeped um, in, in myth. In this myth, idea okay. that like you can't talk to people, you can't ask a provider. And so when you put out a supportive housing RFP, for example, wouldn't it be great to survey the people who have that contract now and ask them where the gaps are and what metrics they're using and what's actually working, what's not. And historically, a lot of that hasn't happened because there's been, there are some real procurement rules that, that create some barriers, but a lot of it is the idea that there's these barriers. And so the NRC is working to dispel that and create more collaboration. But in the meantime, we're left with a lot of RFPs and contracts that don't have that collaborative approach and aren't steeped in reality. They're, they, they're not asking providers how much a meal really costs in bed versus, you know, Bay Ridge. And you did, did, what you're saying is DIFT is not saying we want to know how much it costs. DIFT is saying this is how much we're giving right. you. Right. Do it or don't do it. Exactly. And because you're in the industry of providing charity and good work, you are doing it and then having to have this extra piece where you simply have to figure out a way to pay for it. Right. And okay. then as, the, you know, as costs go up, you have to either fundraise, some groups fundraise to fill the gaps, some take on other types of contracts, whether state or foundational, you know, to fill the gaps. But what we are seeing in the last 10 years is that that gap has gotten too wide um, and that providers are starting to merge or close. Um, Figs was one, but there are others who have done, we've seen a lot of mergers in the last couple of years. And um, we're starting to see organizations turn back contracts, which is the worst thing that you want to see because it means that those communities are going either unserved or other groups may be trying to pick up those contracts who have less experience or are new to the area um, or haven't done the math to see okay, how so bad those contracts This are. is going to be my last thought and then turn it back to the chair because uh, uh, these fine <laughs> folks are going to answer all my other questions and I won't have to say anything else. But um, what I would urge you to do is, you know, this is the contracts committee, it's the contracts, but when aging comes and, and the commissioner of aging is talking to the council, you, you should be there telling the aging committee exactly what's going on. I know a lot of this focus with seniors, but the reality is that, um, you know, our work is from, you know, age one day until age, until someone's no longer here. So at the council, we do all ages, but the, the work of nonprofits when it comes to seniors is really the lifeblood of what we're doing because that's the point where folks are not able to make it anymore. Mm -hmm. and, and there's nothing we can do to, to increase their ability to earn an income except to take the burdens off of them, whether it's for food, whether it's for housing and things like that. So that's where you guys come in. And if the city is not doing its fair share, um, and, and by that I mean 100% reimbursement. I don't think that um, it's an outlier. I know Chair has uh, long advocated for that. He's long thought about that and, and other members of his body. Um, you should be reimbursed 100% of the cost of providing food for senior citizens. So you should take the show on the road, not to be flip about it, but you really should be there at that aging committee when they do that and, and tell them that what DIFT is doing, um, they need to increase it on their side. Absolutely. Right. That was my little, uh, that, that, that's not even a question. That was my little <laughs> spiel because I have the microphone. Yeah, but just to, to su support uh, what my colleague said, I mean, um, you know, I see this committee really as being an open door for folks like you to direct which way we should go, you know? So hearing from you guys, um, the challenges and the struggles and the things that persist or things have gotten better um, is absolutely critical to what we're doing here. So that's why it's so important to hear from you. Um, Carlin, CPC. 
Hello, good morning. Good morning. Um, before I begin on my testimony, I actually wanted to quickly address the points that council members Perkins and Yeager brought up. For us, we do home delivered meals. And for each meal that we deliver, the city pays for approximately 70% of it, and we cover the other 30% of it. For us, that means that we cannot take on more meals than we deliver, despite the fact that we know that we have many senior citizens that would use and need those meals. It also means that we have to cover that cost through fundraising, through lines of credit, and through allowing our program areas and others to not be as robust as they could and should be. Um, I'll move on to my testimony to formally introduce myself. My name is Carlin Cowan. I'm the Chief Policy and Public Affairs Officer at the Chinese American Planning Council. The mission of our organization is to promote the social and economic empowerment of Chinese American immigrant and low-income New Yorkers, and we do so by serving over 60,000 New Yorkers each year through a variety of services from early childhood education, senior services, and everything in between. Thank you very much, Chair Brannon and the members of the council for your leadership on these issues. We'd also like to thank the city and the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee for the strides that they've made and their partnership on these as well. Um, I'm here to support the asks today that my colleagues from HSC and Live On made. We are members of both of those organizations and we are in full support of the asks they're making around increases for indirect, for OTPS, for fringe benefits and other key investments in the sector. And I'm hoping to provide the provider perspective today on what that means to a direct social services agency like the Chinese American Planning Council. While we have made some significant strides with the investments that New York City has made in the cost of living adjustments in indirect, the reality of it is that providers haven't really seen the impacts of that. So last year when we heard that there would be a 2% cost of living adjustment for our staff, obviously staff celebrated they haven't seen that adjustment in a very long time. Yet that money hasn't been dispersed yet, which means that when it came around to December 31st, we had to look at whether or not we could create an increase for that staff, and we simply couldn't afford to put it in. And so we had to say, we're waiting on these contract adjustments to come through. And we don't know how long it'll be, which means that the morale of the staff is lowered, we're seeing turnover increasing, and that in turn destabilizes many of our program participants um, because they're not getting the same high quality of service they should be when there is frequent turnover of the staff that are working with them. We also were told by several city agencies that we would be receiving a 2% indirect rate increase um, for some of our contracts, which would obviously go a long way towards improving the indirect rate we have. Yet we haven't seen any of those increases as well, which means that we've had to put off hiring mission critical staff, which means that we've had to put off doing technological upgrades that would help us run our programs more efficiently. And beyond that, we actually find that that 2% increase doesn't even begin to cover the gap between what the city funds us for our indirect rate and what our actual indirect rate is. Our indirect rate is approximately 17%, which for a nonprofit provider is not actually that high, yet our average fund reimbursement from the city is approximately 9%. We went through the math and we, met and we, we figured out that this means that over $900,000 each year is the tune that we're subsidizing the city for the indirect rate on their contracts. So that means that the city is contracting us to do these services and we are providing a service that the city is mandated to provide and just on the indirect, not even covering other areas like OTPS, we are putting in nearly a million dollars each year to do the services that the city is supposedly paying us to provide. For the council's consideration, my colleagues and I came up with a couple of ideas of what our organization could do with that million dollars if the city were to fund the full cost of doing business with them. We could give a 6% increase to our staff across the board with that money. Our staff are wildly underpaid to do the work that they do. For example, our early childhood education directors, one of whom has been around for 47 years, earn less than a first year DOE pre-K teacher. We could also, provide 6,000 adults with literacy and workforce training for an entire year. We could also provide 400 school-age children with high-quality dual-language after-school programming for an entire year, just for the cost that we are subsidizing the city for their indirect rate. I have a million of these examples, but I know we have a long day ahead, so I'm happy to share them at another time, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have but I urge all of you that are here today to continue pushing the city, to continue doing the good work that you've done, and support the asks of my colleagues that they've presented.
It sounds like a future hearing topic to me. We would um, love to talk at a hearing. I can bring many people to come discuss. Yeah. Um, good question. Yeah, Councilman Perkins. Well, for, um, from what you're, what you're talking about right now. Now, how is it, um, who measures this? You or the controller's office or some other independent kind of uh, entity that helps you understand what's going on and what needs to be done? Uh, you, you understand what I'm trying to say? You, you, who you measures mentioned this what? 900, this, this, was it $900,000 per mm -hmm. year? That's, so, a, that's almost, that's a lot of money. So, so I'll. So, so who, how do you measure that? How do you, quant, how do you get to that number and how do you verify it in a more independent way? So because I if will, it is accurate, then it's very dramatic, and there needs to be some emergency, at, at, you know, some remediation to this, some action taken to address that. So, Absolutely. So for my organization, we measured it through actually this week going through our contracts line by line, looking at the calculation on the indirect cost reimbursement, um, and then looking at our actual re indirect costs for all of our contracts and comparing the difference between them. Um, I'm sure that my colleagues at the table can speak to how it is done across the sector more broadly. <laughs> uh, so similarly, our, it has to do, you know, every organization based on the types of service they provide has a unique indirect rate, right? So if you do um, work with incarcerated youth, you have more security and therefore a higher indirect rate than if you run a senior center that I think would require less security. Um, and so indirect rates vary by organizations and the types of services they provide. So or every organization themselves has to go through and see kind of what their rate is um, and then compare it. And most city contracts do have a standard rate um, that doesn't look at what the organization actually needs, and it, it hovers around 10%. And the only reason I can even say that is because of the increase that the council was supportive of last year. Uh, before that, indirect rates ran ran from, there are con some contracts that have a zero or 2% rate, but most were, were around 8%. Um, and so, you know, you can just, knowing what your organizational rate is versus what the average rate is on your contracts, which vary slightly, is how every organization could figure that out themselves. And most of them do know that information. So basically, it's the norm and not the exception. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's it's actually what's abnormal is for an organization to like be able to dive into their books that well. So we appreciate our <laughs> providers that have you know staff capabilities and and the right kind of tools to do that. Um, but it's absolutely the norm. I mean, all of these contracts are under uniquely underfunded in their own way. But I can speak with a lot of certainty that they're all underfunded, uh, both in they're program and in indirect. I didn't hear what you said. They're all what? They're all underfunded, underfunded in, in yeah. some way, um, both on in the indirect and in the administrative cost right. side and on the programmatic right. side. Okay. So, just, yep. so is it um, appropriate to say that underfunded means underserved? I think what we've seen is that providers have cut every corner that they possibly can since the recession to, to whether it's you know limiting program hours to not giving staff increases to cutting down on, you know, putting in a new generator, uh, fixing a leaky roof. We have you know, groups that have one of two elevators that are working. Um, and so I would say that that does impact services in some way, whether it's high turnover rate. This in the, generally in the sector, it's over 30% turnover rate. And when you're dealing with people in crisis, they need to have consistency. And so while the providers are absolutely doing the best that they can, you know, if you had fully funded contracts with teams who were managing and being able to be innovative and not kind of looking at cash flow every moment, you would have better organizations who are able to provide better services. I would also add that I agree that underfunded means underserved. I think it means that in a couple of ways. Number one, it means underserving people in need in New York. We have wait lists for almost every program of ours, whether it's for enrollment for public benefits, waiting for meals, for case management, for services for HIV AIDS and anything beyond that. It means underserved for our employees who are grossly underpaid to do the work that they do. Um, and we are frankly creating the next generation of people in poverty with the way that we pay our human services employees. And it means underserved for even the clients that we do work with as careful as we try to be to ensure that we are taking on the right number of clients so that we're providing adequate services with the way that we are reimbursed to provide services. We cannot provide the high quality services with dignity that people in New York deserve. 
I would add to that too, to echo on the wait lists for um, various senior services um, and case management, which um, she just referenced, there's um, about 1,100 seniors on wait lists citywide, um, waiting for, um, on a wait list for case management to just have the social worker come to their house to kind of assess them and, and get them into that system. And there's about 200 seniors on wait lists for home care. Um, so again, yes, it does impact, it has to impact something and it's impacting a lot of things. And, um, you know, again, we did have some kind of historic budget ads last year for um, particularly these two services and we're starting to see, um, you know, some of the, at least the home care wait lists go down. But that's the other point is that um, funding in the system takes time and being able to project further, um, you know, to, to address these so that we're not back and talking about wait lists the next year is really important. So it all goes into the planning and, and the ability to, to deliver the services. Thank you. Okay, we have um, Monsignor Sullivan from Catholic Charities. Monsignor, how are you? Okay. You might even be happier if I didn't press the button, but, um, <laughs> but I'm sure you're not going to be disappointed if I don't read my testimony, but just submit it and kind of do a little bit of a <laughs> summary that will basically kind of support and affirm what, what my colleagues have done. Let me frame this in, in a context. Okay. The context that I'd like to frame is that over the past 10 years, we have made some very good progress in the two areas I'm going to address. The areas of the efficiency of the contracting process and the adequacy of funding. And I can even use in a coherent same sentence the Bloomberg and de Blasio administrations who have, have the same trajectory of trying to make this a more efficient process and more adequately funded. So I want to first begin by complimenting, primarily but not exclusively, the dedicated civil servants, particularly in Mox and in other places, who have innovatively moved us in a direction where we are far ahead of where we were years ago. But we're not at the end of the road. We're not at the middle of the road. We're probably part way down the road to where we need to be. So first, let me speak to the issue of efficiency. The issue of efficiency, I would just like to exemplify that with one of our Catholic Charities agencies, just one of them. In the past six months, we have 32 contracts in which there's $3.9 million in outstanding claims. In addition to that, in the first six months, we filed over 200 accountability filings with city agencies on that contract. And so we have another 115 that we can't file yet because the contracts haven't been pending. So there is a huge ability for us to do better, even though we done better now than we did a number of years ago. So I point that out as just a very concrete example of that we still have a ways to go with that. And the agencies that I represent, some 90 of them, we deliver probably about $200 million of services in contracts with New York City, probably more than 1,000 contracts. So when I mention this, this is not a relatively small sample. This extends to almost every agency that is there. So, Accelerator has been an incredibly good process. The first phase good. We got two more phases. Let's keep the focus on it so that we move in that right direction. Um, the Passport, putting Vendex online, good in the direction. But let's make sure all the agencies follow it. Let's not make sure, and by the way, I understand the issues with the Department of Education and all of those things, but we gotta make them do the right thing too in the way that they deal with with these, uh, these contracts. So that's the area of efficiency. Now let me go to the area of adequacy. I would just like to compliment my, my colleague here. And to Councilman per Perkins' point, listen, almost all of our agencies are audited each year. They file a 990. 
And so you can look right on their audited financial statements, their administrative costs, their fundraising costs, and then you compare that with what you get from New York City. So this, for agencies that keep their books in these ways, these are not made up numbers. And I can tell you on average, on average, from the agencies we've looked at, our administrative rate hovers a little bit under 15%. And what we get reimbursed from New York City is probably about 9%, 9.2%. So you immediately have a 5% a gap in your administrative costs alone. So our estimate is that the numbers that have been used is that on the $4.7 billion of human service contracts, we think there's probably about a 10% gap between what it's costing agencies to deliver these services and what it's being run, or half a billion dollars, on the give or take five billion dollars. So the investment that New York City made last year of 190 million additional dollars, three to four percent, is good. But it doesn't get us even close to what the adequacy is. So that's why we may phrase it a little differently, but I would encourage the city council to add an additional three to four percent this year, an additional $200 million to get us closer there. And if you just give me one minute, here's what I think to keep us focused, okay? So what I want to keep you focused on, and it is. I hope you brought enough for everybody. <laughs> it certainly is, it certainly is. So I thought about this last week, I can order a Domino's pizza with one press on the button of that. And you know what else I can do? I can track whether they're putting the toppings on it, whether it's going in the oven, whether it's come out of the oven, whether it's ready for me to pick up. I'm not suggesting we can do human service contracting with that efficiency. Why not? Right. Why can't we do better? If Domino's can do it. Right. And then when I get home and I open my Domino's pizza box and I take out the pizza, guess what? It's a whole pie. <laughs> they don't keep 12% of it like the city does when they buy services from us. This is great. So all I'm saying is if you don't remember anything else, the, the goal should be a Domino's app for human service contracting, and just give us a whole pie when you buy services from it. Thank you so much. I think you should be sitting here, Muncie. <laughs> oh, no, I, I haven't been that bad. <laughs> no, it's, it's very, I think, I think we're obviously onto something here, and it's, it's unacceptable, you know. Um, the, the, the reliance the city has on um, organizations like yours is, you know, it's invaluable. So to get home and part of your pizza is missing, <laughs> that's just insult to injury. Um, but yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Monsignor. Uh, you know, we, uh, for those who don't follow the Monsignor and I on Twitter, uh, we <laughs> had a little TV show this weekend. Um, so we're going to take our show Council on the Member, road. Thank you for making me look good on the show. Oh, no, my senior, you're the one who comes in with the uniform. I just, uh, <laughs> um, but I appreciate that you brought the props in today. Um, I had a, and and you bring uh, you bring some jovialness, if you will, to uh, to an otherwise boring topic. But it's a serious question and it's yes. a serious topic. And you've been doing this for a long time. And I wanted to touch on something that you uh, mentioned. You. You said, I think you, uh, that Catholic Charities has about $200 million in contracts, right. representing approximately 1,000 contracts. But that's the $200 million, that's the contracted amount. Right. The, the, the Catholic Charities actually spends probably far more than the $200 million on those particular contracts, right. for leaving aside the other charitable works <laughs> that are not contracts. Right. Are you able to give us a number of what those $200 million in contracts actually cost the, the Catholic Charities? Between 220 and 225. Okay. I think we're about... I think we spend between, between about 10%, give or take, more than we're reimbursed on the contracts. And it's made up in two ways. One from private philanthropic fundraising, and, and this is where it really hurts some of the smaller community-based organizations. 
We are blessed with generous donors who want us to do this, but some of the small organizations aren't able to raise some of those private philanthropic dollars. So part of it is the private philanthropic dollars. That's most of it. But this isn't a precise science. So if you don't have money, people maybe work extra hours. You don't hire an additional staff person, or you have people stretch, or you hold a vacancy for three months, and you have somebody cover somebody else's jobs. These are complex organizations to run, but it's, it's basically primarily private dollars and stretching in order to do it. So, not, and not to beat this to death because we've talked about it, but you know, and the church has been feeding the poor and the hungry for 2,000 years. So there's no doubt you're gonna right. do what you're gonna do. Um, but when you're talking about $20 million in funding that you have to find right. to supplement a service that's in essence what the taxpayers are supposed to be doing because right. we've undertaken that, uh, not, not me, but my predecessor council and the council before that and the council before that, mm. historically the city has undertaken that as an obligation. So now we've, if you will, offloaded our obligations to Catholic Charities, to the right. other organizations to pick that up. What you're talking about is a $20 million hole at the low end. Right. Okay. So right. Just wanna, I'm going to make sure that that number's there so that people understand that we're not talking about you know, $100,000 here, $100,000 there, and pretty soon you're talking about real money, but in one organization itself, and yes, it's, it's large, but it's large for a reason, uh, there's a $20 million hole, and then you talked about a million dollar hole, and uh, I don't remember that you put precise numbers on it, but that's yeah. across the board in the nonprofit sector. Yeah, and again, just because I keep simple mom numbers in my mind, if you give me one standard deviation of error, I use them. So we got about $5 billion of human service contracts. A little bit shy of that, okay? We think there's a 10% gap. We think across the sector that there's a $500 million gap between what those contracts fund and what it costs to deliver those services. You know, give me a little bit of flexibility. Maybe it's 510 million, maybe it's 490, but, but that's about the gap that we need to make up. Incredible. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you guys very, very much. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Your testimony was great. Okay, thank we have so our much. final. What? Um, what? Uh, Pizza thing? <laughs> Tawaki Kamatsi, did I say that right? You want me to do it. Yep. Let me um, play a video for you before I present my, I guess, the verbal testimony. Um, I had a, there was a meeting that the mayor had. You got to speak on the mic, so please. The sure. Oh. Hi, um, I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I testified say at name, a, say, say your name and, and Tuaki Komatsu. Okay, you're just representing yourself. Right? Yes. Okay. Um, I was at a city council meeting with Mr. Yeager yesterday. Um, it was a pretty good meeting. Um, on July 18th of last year, there was a, a public meeting in Kew Gardens where I had the opportunity to talk to Stephen Banks, who's in the other in the chamber right now as well as the mayor. Um, and one of the issues that I talked to the mayor on that date was about procurement fraud with regards to city contracts. So instead of me rehashing it, I can play back the video that shows my statements to the mayor and how he responded. So let me do that. It's right here. Turn it around for you to see. Um, crap. Tell you what, there's a problem with my, the video right now. But basically, yeah, well, a public, a, town hall. a public resource fair, actually. Okay. But, and, and just summarize the conversation. Sure. So basically, there's a company that's been committing wage theft against me for the last six years since 2012. It's doing business with HRA. Um, during that meeting, I asked Mr. Banks and the mayor specifically, can you please cancel uh, the city's contracts with, H with uh, this company, NTT Data? Um, some of the documents that I gave you at the start of, uh, well, before I took the seat, s fully substantiate the fact that it committed wage theft, that's still committing wage theft against me as I sit in this chair. So the question is, if taxpayers are paying for those contracts, then why in the hell should they be supporting a company that's still committing wage theft against me? 
Um, I submitted a FOIL request to HRA. The same person who actually retaliated against me six years ago signed a business deal with HRA. So it's not just like um, this company committed the wage theft, the same person who had me fired um, on April 27th, he's the same specific person who signed this uh, business deal on September 10th of 2015. So um, HRA's contracts with that company, it gives them the ability to terminate that contract within 30 days for any reason. So if I'm blacklisted while I'm sitting in this chair from jobs with city agencies, um, I've tried, uh, what do you call it, walking through the doors to public town hall meetings previously. I talked to Mr. Perkins. Um, I advised him that I was being illegally kept out of the, those meetings despite the fact that I'm a whistleblower. Um, and one of the people that orchestrated that exclusion is the mayor's head of security who's defending a federal civil rights lawsuit across the street right now. He's going to have to face trial in June. Um, what can you do about it? Because essentially, um, I found out who competed against this, com this company for HRA's business. There are like 30 competitors. So if those 30 other competitors are willing to comply with all applicable laws and regulations, then why in the hell should, sorry for the language, um, why should this company be rewarded for committing wage theft against me? Do you work in IT services? Yeah. Okay. And it's a major government contractor. They've got contracts with the Attorney General for New York State, the Justice Department. Um, in fact, I recently submitted and e sent an email to one of their competitors that's competing for a contract with the Department of Education to ask this federal agency, well, if this company is committing wage theft against me, why award them the contract instead of... Yeah, I hear, I hear you. And also, bottom line is there are other matters too. Um, if you're not paid what you're owed, it's going to cause serious problems uh, to you with being able to pay your rent. So I went to housing court. I wasn't able to get legal counsel. Um, I, was filed, I was subjected to frivolous litigation. Um, and I got into the homeless system, the shelter system. I currently live in shelter in the Bronx for military veterans. That same shelter provider basically committed a bait and switch with my lease agreement that I signed at HRA, HRA's offices on February 16th of 2016. I notified HRA three days later after learning about that bait and switch. It didn't take corrective action. As a result of its negligence, I got 15 punches to my left temple. Can I ask, who is your, your local council person? Uh, Rafael Sal Salamanca. I gave him documentation to fully substantiate it, but he didn't take action. Okay. So, I bottom mean, line is... You, 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 there's some serious allegations here. I mean, be happy to listen to them. I don't know if this is the venue for it. it but like if you have the, I guess, oversight capability, meaning if I've had face-to-face -face conversations with Stephen Banks, the commissioner of HRA, he told me on uh, December 14th in Brooklyn at the end of the mayor's public town hall meeting with regards to the assault that took place in that shelter that HRA is not uh, responsible for crime. Actually, it is. There's a court decisions confirming it. So, I mean, if the roles were reversed, if you were sitting in this chair where I'm sitting and, and if I were sitting where you're sitting and you had, you know, what I'm telling you to tell to me, then I don't want my, what's, coming out of my, what's coming out of my wallet to subsidize operations where Urban Pathways is having a fundraiser at the Grand Hyatt on, I think, May 10th. While its CEO is making over $200,000 $200, a year, it doesn't have the building registered with HPD as required by law. It commits baits and, uh, bait and switches such that I get 15 punches to my left temple. That caused me a concussion that deprived me of the ability to uh, perform well during a job interview on what, August 18th for a job that would have paid me $450 a day. Okay. I think this might be something where you should come and see me in my office and we can discuss well, it. I mean, I'd be happy to look into the, to these items. But, but even short of that, I already have litigation against HRA, so my presence during this meeting today, I mean, I don't mean to be rude with you at all. It just, I've been to these meetings before. I've testified truthfully, whereas Stephen Banks misleads the council, commits outright li lies to the council. So it's my intent when I walk into court tomorrow to file a res for a restraining order that will preclude HRA from continuing its business with NTT data that will essentially put a halt to the legal assistance I've been requesting for, requesting for two years, have not received. So if I have to wait at the back of the line to get legal assistance while other people are getting it without delay, without interference, then if I have to, uh, I guess, do the Article 78 at Supreme Court, which I have already filed, if I have to walk through the doors at Supreme tomorrow to file that motion, I will. Okay, I think that's that's your right. Anyway, thank you for your time. Okay, thank you. And I think uh, with that, we're adjourned.